Hey, what's going on? Welcome to week three. Hey everyone, welcome to week three, the gift, the very first week of the gift. Yes, that's right. Andres here and Shan here and we're excited um, for this lesson, right? So I just want to preface it with, you know, a very quick story of when we started. Um, we didn't really know who our avatar was and, or we thought we knew at the time, but really we were very far off. We didn't know the first thing about him. And it did not go as planned. And, you know, it's one of the things that we um, see most entrepreneurs struggling with, even when they work with us, when we also had the agency. People just don't know exactly who they're serving because it really impacts everything. So everything is customer-centric. Everything is about the client's well-being. And so we want to make sure that we understand the avatar really well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So as we said, um, in the first lesson, when we gave a general overview of the authentic authority, we said that the gift, which is the second part of the authentic authority, is actually four weeks long. So this is actually the longest of all of the four different modules. And the reason for that is because it is extremely important and it can be very in-depth. It can be difficult when you don't understand exactly what you're doing. And so we really want to give you all of the gold nuggets yeah, that's right. in this. And so... <laughs> And we're getting started with the ideal avatar. And so the objective of this lesson is I've defined my niche and I know who my ideal avatar is. I can communicate their deepest problems, fears, and desires better than they can themselves. Mm -hmm. Key topics of this lesson. So there's five. Number one, understanding the big picture. Mm -hmm. Number two, creating a movement of impact. Number three, defining your niche and standing out. Number four, how to create your ideal avatar. And number five, how to create and use an empathy map. Yes. So we're just going to jump right in with understanding the big picture. All right. So this is so key because um, I just want to give you a quick overview of, you know, how the online world really operates and works because it's easy, very, very, very easy to get drawn into marketing tactics and gimmicks and different little things here and there. And let me tell you, keep it simple. You need to understand how it works and then you can play within the variables. But a lot of people get so distracted and believe me, again, I used to be one of them. I used to have like the most complicated funnels and the most complicated like, you know, processes and structures. And it was just really a, you know, trying to overcompensate for what I didn't know. And so, you know, we've invested in, in mentors that have changed and shaped our, our thinking differently. And that's when we started seeing a, you know, greater success. So just real quick, you know, it all really starts at the traffic level. Okay. And we're going to just for now divide it into free and paid traffic. All right. Number two, it's the website or the funnel. And so, yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where, um, you know, you start understanding that the website is <laughs> kind of outdated now because people do not want, oh, give me one second. You know what? I, I see that uh, there's some um, audio issues going on. Give me one sec. Just going to make sure. We're gonna make sure that, yeah, there you go. Give it just one second, gotta uh, make sure the system works well, cause I think we're having some audio issues, one second.
All right, can you hear us? Let's see, let's like retest the audio and go back to uh, kind of where we were. Uh, let me just make sure here on the chat. All right. All right, let's just keep going here. I think everything is good. Um, so yes, the big picture, uh, once again, we're gonna just look at it as free or paid traffic, um, the website or funnel. And really the big question is, how many people buy in average? And we're just taking this across industries. We've seen it over and over. Uh, one to 5% of people buy usually. Um, and this goes for any offer, you know, high ticket, low ticket, doesn't really matter. The other 95%, doesn't so that's when the retargeting and the nurturing comes in okay this is just at a very you know uh, high level uh, I, I found this picture really I you know I'm a big fan of the matrix I love the whole concept and, and this is really how it looks like from a 50,000 foot view so I want to show you this right now so you got traffic you got leads you got sales, you got retention. What does it all look like? How does it all put together? Because believe me, one of the things you'll face is you'll start to mix things or confuse things if they're not um, properly organized. And we just want to give you a very well uh, put overview so that when you go through this process yourself, you don't get uh, confused or overwhelmed with like a ton of different information. It's easy to get sucked into, you know, webinars and into like other lead magnets and all the different things that other people are doing and, you know, think that you're missing out on something. But in reality, this is just how it looks like. And, you know, if you understand this, you'll be able to navigate all the variables within it. Okay, so let's just look at it quickly. Number one, we got traffic. As I said, there's paid traffic and there's free traffic. Okay, free traffic generated by content. Paid traffic is when you pay, whether it's Facebook or YouTube or Google or solo ads, multiple different things. But at that stage, we are at the awareness stage. They don't know us. You're a complete stranger. And so we want to start by giving value. They are seeking educational information to help grow in their knowledge of solutions. Why solutions? Because at this stage, a lot of them are either unaware that they even have a problem or they are at least problem aware. So um, let me just say, I'll recommend you watch the replay. There might be a lot of golden nuggets that you might want to go back and check, specifically the sheet if you want to like read it a bit more in depth. But let's keep going here. We got a lot of information, so you know, make sure that you can stop your own time. All right. Having said that, we go from traffic to the leads. That's the middle of the funnel. Now we're talking about the consideration stage. They know you. And now it's seeking demonstration of solutions and expertise comparing to other solutions, right? This is where your webinars comes in, your sales pages come in, your buyer videos, your methodology, your process happens at this stage, something that makes you stand out. It's interesting. It says comparing to other solutions. So at this point, you're just an option. That's right. right? You're not the choice yet. Because not yet. just gotten to know you but you are definitely now in their radar and they're right. considering working with you or buying your product, yeah. whatever that may be. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if you're you know, selling a physical product, a digital product, you know, these are really the, the processes that have been you know, battle and proven tested to get someone from a complete stranger all the way to a, um, not just a buying customer, but a loyal and like a raving fan, you know, that's the retention stage. So what happens from the, traffics to the leads there's a conversion that's almost like a raised hand then what happens from the leads to the sales funnel all right well the the, the sales piece is where they need to take action they need to take a commitment all right and if you're here in this program obviously you've made a commitment and so you've gone through our funnel uh, whether it was through organic whether it was through ads and so now you're at that sales funnel at that quote estimate or a free consultation a demo a trial or simply a you know low ticket item uh, whatever that may be and then finally there's the retention piece where again we talk about the long-term value so once again this is just a very high level view that you go from traffic to leads to sales to retention and you want to keep this process in mind as you go through any of the tactical things all right we're going to get into more tactics later 
but the foundation of successful business relationships versus unsuccessful. And I want you to like memorize this because I wish I did. I wish we did when we're starting um, because it seems simple and sometimes simple things we tend to discard them. We think that there's gotta be a secret sauce or a magic recipe. And like in reality, no matter the niche or market you work in, every successful transaction will depend on these three key things like no and trust. And so here's an expanded view of that no like and trust conversion. Um, again, it's almost like a, a, a funnel that is happening now internally, right? So externally, the other is happening where they're going to the actual website, your funnel, your content, whatever that might be. And then on this side, uh, it's happening internally where they're, who are you? These questions they've been answering in their heads. Who are you? What do you do? Should I care on their no? Like, do I like you? Do I like what you have to say? Trust. Are you an expert? Can you help me? Have others had success? And finally, the conversion, which is, what do I do next? How do I get started? And the truth is that relation, uh, transactional relationships suck, all right? And Matilda was uh, one of my uh, favorite movies <laughs> uh, when I was growing up. And we used to watch it with, with uh, my sisters. And so, yes, if you had any experience of being sold by a greasy or a sleazy salesman, <laughs> like the one that you see here on the screen, uh, you will know that they suck. No one wants to be sold. But here's the truth. Most businesses think short term. The difference between million dollar businesses and broke ones is mindset. Because if you could download the information of millionaires and billionaires, you could very well get to that place in a very short amount of period of time. You know, really the main difference, like how is it that some succeed and some don't when there's all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds? You know, they come from, some come from a lot, some come from a little. Some, you know, have certain challenges and disabilities, some don't. And so, but, but there's success everywhere you look in different communities and races and tribes. It doesn't really matter. It's mindset. It's the, it's the internal that makes the long-term difference. Right. And again, it's not to say that everyone's journey is equal, that everyone starts off from the same place. That's certainly not true. But at the end of the day, what will differentiate everyone is the way they think about their life, the opportunities, and their business. Right. Exactly. So most businesses think short-term. And we want you to think differently. The difference between broke businesses and million dollar businesses, I want, I want you to take a quick look at this, a very um, in-depth view at it actually, because it's literally like an iceberg, okay? Most people worry so much in the front end, so much of their attention happens in the front end, and sometimes that gives them the wrong idea, the wrong metrics, the wrong focus, because it's not just about the initial sale. It's not just about that first transaction. Again, we don't want to fall into the trap of being transactional. Okay. And if you take a look at the back end, right? See, you, you, you'll read list segmenting, relationship, customer centric, revenue potential, tribe, trust and attention. Notice how trust and attention is at the very bottom. Why? Because trust and attention is the hardest thing to earn. Okay, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of marketers, a lot of different things, but you need to be a signal, a song in the midst of this noise. And it doesn't happen in the front end. Trust and attention happens it over time. It takes time to build trust. And if you look at that, you know, kind of like you've always said in a relationship, whether it was a marriage, you know, you may have had some basic consideration for the person you were getting to know them, but you certainly didn't trust them. You didn't know what all their values were. You didn't know every single thing about what their beliefs were. And so you probably wouldn't therefore have asked someone to marry you on the first date. Right. It probably would have taken quite some time to really get to know that person through and through and then make that kind of a commitment. And the same thing is true in business. Someone wants to know who you are, what your values are, what you stand for, who you've helped previously before mm -hmm. they make that commitment with you as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100%. And here are the six pillars of business. Because again, I want you to get a very good idea of this big picture. And I want you to understand that no matter what business you choose to go to or you're in currently, these are commonalities. You know, the marketing funnel is a commonality. 
um, you know, all the different pieces and components of the six pillars of business are commonality. So number one, mindset, as we've been saying, and if you are, uh, you know, very diligent in doing some of these exercises, some of these clarity sheets, et cetera, you will see that it takes a lot more mindset uh, than you probably thought and that that's okay. Number two, there's marketing, there's sales, very key to differentiate between marketing and sales. We'll go into it more later. Operations and systems, okay, this is all your, uh, you know, structure and management and, you know, processes. Then you got the product and the delivery of that product to the customer. Of course, the customer is there as well. And six, finance. Okay. Now, I want you to understand something very key. There's linear thinking and there's non-linear thinking. In order to operate at the highest level as an entrepreneur, you have to get out of the linear thinking. Okay, and linear thinking is things such as the nine to five, the traditional nine to five versus being an entrepreneur. You know, that you go from a, you know, assistant to a junior assistant, to a manager, to a VP, to a, right? And you like climb this value ladder, you know, almost inside the company. Um, diplomas versus just solving problems. Okay, a lot of people think that you get paid according to the number of diplomas or certificates you have. This is also a linear thinking. You get paid by the complexity of problems that you solve in your marketplace. A fixed niche versus, a niche versus an evolving niche. Again, linear thinking says, oh, you're only an accountant or you're in uh, you know, e-commerce or you're like just these big buckets that don't make sense anymore because we're always evolving. And there's so many different things that you'll <laughs> discover in this lesson. Just remember this piece. Then you got the fixed career path versus a changing career path. You know, people that say, okay, I'm going to be a doctor forever. You know, sometimes people are so afraid to choose something in college or in university because they think they're going to be in that forever. And the truth is most people are changing now. You know, they're, they're realizing that it's not what they want. It's not what they thought. And a lot of people are changing. So it's a different thinking. And of course, phone versus social media, talking to one person versus being able to talk to a lot of people at once. So I want you to understand this, okay? This is very crucial. I want you to pay so much attention if you're doing anything, if your mind is somewhere else, because this is gonna be literally life or death in business. And why do I say this? Because I've lost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in these things, in these traps, in these, you know, diseases, darkness that, you know, plagues our businesses, plagues our minds and our lives. And you need to be like, even if all you did in this lesson was learn this for, believe me, it's going to change the way you operate fundamentally. Okay. So number one, little to no focus or shiny object syndrome. Okay. This is when you switch from opportunity to opportunity, you change niches, you start products and you never launch because something better came along. You second guess yourself. And the truth is that the grass is green where you water it. Right, not on the other side. It's where you water it. It's where you water it. And we, most often than not, we start finding a little bit of failure, you know, a little bit of resistance. And we want to switch. We want to go into the next thing because we think it's too, too big for us. Right, or too uncomfortable. And so our mind tricks us into thinking, something else must be easier. This one's too hard, it's too complicated. The next one must be easier. Uh, and it's not true. <laughs> Every single type of business, if you wanna be a business owner and grow a business, it's gonna be difficult no matter what type of business that is. Your problems may vary a little bit, they may change, but it's always gonna be difficult. Yeah. And it should be, because if you wanna be in the top, you know, money earners, top 10%, by percent well, Yes, it's going to be difficult then because the average person doesn't do that for a very important reason. Yeah. That it's hard. Yeah. And you got to understand that if it was so easy, um, then everyone obviously would have already been a millionaire working online. Uh, and people sometimes make it seem easier than what it really is. But in reality, is long term, anything worth building, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. Again, it's like a relationship, you know. Uh, if you have a relationship that's thriving is because you've spent a lot of time communicating uh, with each other and 
you know, building a solid foundation for, you know, kids, or if you already have kids, you're still building on that foundation and it, it, it's not, it's not easy. Right. So that's one, make sure that you're not being sucked into things that seem, Oh yeah, it's going to be super easy. Like, or I can do it on the side or like nothing like focus, 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 focus. Okay. Two, no power action. Most people put very little effort into executing all the pieces and components. And so surprise, surprise, they have holes and gaps and then they wonder why something didn't work. Okay. So that's another one. Okay. It's like, you, it's a little bit better because you're doing some of this stuff, but you're not doing all of them. So you have some, but you don't have others. So you're operating at like a 70%. Imagine a car operating at like, you know, 70% of its capacity and the engine is like, like literally getting so, yeah, like not operating with all the cylinders, you know, it, it just not, does not work. It's not meant to go like that. And of course there's holes and that leads to, um, yeah just death (laughs) yeah let's do mediocrity the truth is that power comes directly from faith and purpose don't forget that overthinking again if you're a creative and i've talked about this before chances are you tend to also overanalyze things very deeply and from multiple different angles and you're skeptic and that's okay while this is a good thing at times it can also lead you to inaction and procrastination you know i'm one of the best procrastinators there are and i used to even take pride in it (laughs) stop that yeah and i used to even take pride in it you know when i when when not realizing that it's not you know something wise and and that you know you having done something really really quick in less time than you expected doesn't really it's not something you know it's not an attribute to 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 look forward because in reality uh, we need to be very wise and have a good steward with every hour we have in our life. Not just, you know, put a hundred percent on one hour and then the other ones are like, uh, you're just like chilling. Like it doesn't work that way. You know, it's also unrealistic to think that, you know, everything is going to come very easy or you're going to be extremely skilled at everything. Mm-hmm. Some things you're going to like to do and really desire to do. And that's great for the long term in business. You can really focus on that zone of genius. But in the beginning, there are going to be areas that you just have to step up to because you're the only one in the business at this point. Mm -hmm. And that was hard for us to accept, but it's a reality. And you have to know the foundation so that you can therefore delegate it later and be a good teacher um, and guide to those people in your business as well. Exactly. Most people believe that feeling resistance is negative. And so they give up quickly at the first signs of uncomfort. So keep going, keep going, especially at the beginning, keep going. Also for imposter syndrome, feeling like you aren't good enough with what you know or what you do, or what you have to offer. You're comparing yourself to others. You're thinking that you cannot make a lot of money and you don't deserve even to have a lot of money. You start having like limiting money mindsets. And this is like really detrimental as well. Okay, and so we're gonna get into the next part of the lesson which is creating a movement of impact. And again, because we are now going into the gift, which is where you're going to be stepping up into, you know, some sort of a leadership role, whether you're selling a product or a service, it's really important that you understand the foundations of a movement because in some way, shape or form, that is exactly what you are trying to do when you are trying to gain people to know, like, and trust you you're trying to get them to follow you to a solution that they're seeking in some way. So regardless of time, location, or culture, every great movement of impact has had three things in common. Number one, they've had a cause. And we have named this in The Authentic Authority. That is where we put our vision. So the cause is the vision. What are you going towards? Where are you taking people towards? What is it that they are seeking in faith? Number two, there was a leader. There was a main leader. And in our program, we have the guide. And you will be going into that later after you've done the gift and the voice. But just so you know, that is essentially what we are focusing on there is you stepping into that leadership position. Number three is the new opportunity. And in the authentic authority, that entails the gift and the voice. And that's why it's here highlighted in blue because that is now what we're starting. We're starting to craft what is the new opportunity that you as a leader are going to be giving to your tribe, to 
to your ideal avatar once you figure out exactly who that is. And so we're going to just do a brief overview of what each of these three different components are. And since we just passed the uh, MLK Day yesterday, I thought it would be great to kind of focus on the civil rights movement so that we could see how this sort of plays into the big picture here. So number one, cause for the vision. So every successful impact-driven movement has possessed a future-based cause that was bigger than its participants and supporters. And so as an example, the civil rights movement's cause was social justice and equality for African-Americans. So as we know, in this time, African-Americans, -Ameri amongst many other ethnic groups within the US, did not have social justice. They did not have equality. They faced violence on a daily basis. They were segregated from white Americans. And so the vision that the leaders of this movement painted for the people, both black and white, and all other ethnic groups was that we all could have social justice, everyone could have equality, and we could all be equal under, in God's eyes and in humanity's eyes. But fear of the future causes us to lean against and cling to the present while faith in the future renders us perceptive to change. And that is by Eric Hoffer from a book, which I really want to dive into even more, called The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements. And so essentially what this means is that when we have a fear of what is coming, we tend to not do anything. Right. We tend to become paralyzed, and we therefore need our faith to overpower our fear. And it is not definitely easy to do, but since fear is such a basic human emotion and we feel it on a daily basis, the faith has to be greater. And so when people fear the unknown future, they will typically stop moving forward altogether. Therefore, for you to have success in your business and anything in your life, you must give your followers faith in a better future so that they will be perceptive to the change you are going to offer them, which in this case, in the authentic authority, is called your new opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so just some quotes here to kind of paint the vision uh, of what Martin Luther King was painting for the people, what that faith sort of looked like it's and how it encouraged stuff. them. And so this is a famous part of his I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. As we said, at this time, this was not a reality, not even close. And so for most people, I can imagine this seemed very very, very far, if even possible at all. And so we have to do a very good job of painting that this could actually be true and imagine that. Can you imagine what it'd be like mm -hmm. when we are judged by our character and not by the color of our skin? With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. Mm -hmm. And even so, again, at this time, that reality was so far-fetched. He did such an amazing job of painting what that future brotherhood, that beautiful symphony, as he called it, what that would look like, and that there was hope that it was indeed possible. And so the second part of a movement of impact is, the, of course, the leader or the guide. So all movements of impact have a charismatic, influential leader who shares their knowledge, wisdom, and hope with the masses. And so while he wasn't the only one, the only leader in the civil rights movement, he was, of course, one of the main ones. It's Martin Luther King. And I just posted this picture here because while I was actually doing some research, I found this very interesting. After his I Have a Dream speech, the FBI considered Martin Luther King the most dangerous and effective leader in the country. J. Edgar Hoover had him followed, bugged his office, and sent an anonymous letter telling him to commit suicide. And so I just wanted to put this image here just to kind of demonstrate that, that when you become such an influence on people, when people grow to really know, like, and trust you and believe in the vision that you are painting and they trust the tactics and the strategies that you're using to get them there, belief is the strongest thing in the world. When you can get people to believe that you are... Yeah dangerous and hopefully that's for a good that's in a good way obviously we have many leaders throughout our history such as in hitler 
as a prime example, someone who could get many, many people to follow him and believe in what he, what he believed and what he thought and what he was able to do. But of course, you can use that power for extreme good yeah, or evil. extreme evil. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just want to demonstrate here that when you are able to become an influential leader, you are dangerous and you can be dangerous in the best way because you can literally transform someone's life for the better or maybe even millions of lives. In you this got case. it. Mm -hmm. And so I know the first thing that you're probably thinking is that, you know, if you are going to be selling a product or a service or your expertise, you're probably thinking, you know, I don't really see how Martin Luther King relates to me or right. <laughs> how I'm going to become <laughs> even close to that. Right. Um, or I'm not a leader, you know, or maybe, you know, I was a leader in a certain area of my life, but definitely not to that capacity. I know for me, this was very uh, hard to accept a part right. of my identity in a leadership position like this. And so I just want to tell you that you are a leader, even if you don't yet believe it. Most of us look at both historical and present day leaders and believe they are natural born leaders. And maybe in some cases that's true, but in most cases it could not be further from the truth. In reality, all leaders doubt themselves and their ability to guide others. They constantly hear the self-deprecating voice that tells them that they are not enough, that they're a fraud, that they're simply inadequate. So the imposter syndrome that Andres was talking about earlier. Nonetheless, when they hear the internal call to serve and help others, the other voice that we all have in our mind, in our head, they answer it. And so something interesting about this, I was reading something recently about you know, certain celebrities in the media Nonetheless, whether you, you know, watch the movies or not, listen to the music, someone like, you know, Jennifer Lopez or Jodie Foster, whether you like their work or not, I was reading quotations about them, you know, actually saying that until this day, imposter syndrome is something that they still face on a daily basis. Jennifer Lopez has sold something like, you know, over 400 million copies of her music and her CDs in the past and still... Hmm you know, can't really grasp my mind around that. You know, maybe when, they must have made a mistake. They must have bought the wrong album. It must have been, you know, just someone bought it for someone they didn't really want it. Jodie Foster claimed that when she got her first Oscar, she thought they made a mistake. They must have been, they must have been trying to give it to someone else and they miscounted the votes. And it's normal. Even if you've right. achieved extreme success, you still feel a part of you isn't convinced that people actually like you <laughs> or that people actually believe in what your message is. Right. And so sometimes it actually gets even stronger the more lives you change. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to this. This is good. This so stuff. now we're going to go into Tony Robbins' six core human needs. And the reason I put this here was because, as I said at the bottom, people that do step up to a leadership role, they do it because the call, the internal call to serve others, somehow manages to outweigh that voice inside that tells them they're not enough and that no one really likes them. Mm -hmm. And so the main reason is, is because according to Tony Robbins' six core human needs, we have our very basic needs. We have four basic needs, which are certainty, variety, significance, and love and connection. And so certainty would just be, you know, security, security in your relationships, knowing that someone's going to be there for mm -hmm. you, financial security, knowing that your basic needs are going to be met, food, shelter, all of right. these basic needs. And then variety would be, you know, just a little bit of uncertainty, just a little bit right. of, you know, I'm not really sure what's going to happen every single day. And so if you're someone that has worked in an office job or a nine to five, we tend to crave variety when we're in a monotonous yeah, job it's just every like, single ah, day. Yeah. It's so, uh, you know, suffocating right. almost, right? A right? little bit of spontaneity. Yeah, you need more variety. Exactly. Exactly. And the degrees of how everyone needs them are a little bit different depending on your personality. But and where right they there. get filled are different. Exactly. But nonetheless, this four, those four and the um, purple that you see there are like every single person needs them. And sometimes that's why people go into addictions and certain, you know, self-sabotaging behaviors because in reality they're, you know, putting a bandit on a significance or they're putting a bandit on their love and connection that they're not getting and it's not being met with you know uh, their own selves or in their own contentment and self-worth right but, exactly. the, but the interesting thing is that only when those things are covered is when it's you can go into the spiritual needs exactly so if you go exactly if you go down to the bottom two growth which is personal growth and contribution we can only really achieve growth and contribution when first of all our four basic needs are met 
And so it's an interesting concept to understand because evidently, if your basic needs are not met, you're not really looking at a long-term vision if you don't even know where your food's coming from the next day, right? You just don't have the mental capacity to be thinking about that. Luckily, if you're watching this, I'm sure your four basic needs in some way are being met. Mm -hmm. um, so spirit needs, those are really the only needs that are actually going to fulfill us though we need to get to a point of personal growth and contribution and so that inner voice that called to serve it's the contribution it's the core need the spiritual need of contribution that you need to answer even though you are scared and so while personal growth is a necessary prerequisite the only true path to fulfillment is contribution and so meaning that you can work on yourself, you can work on your personal development, learn multiple languages, learn an incredible amount of skills, become incredibly valuable in the marketplace to your family, to greater society. But if you are not sharing those gifts, if you are not sharing those talents, if you are not using those skills, expertise, talents in a way that is now flowing over your cup into the lives of other people, you still feel like you are lacking. Mm -hmm because that is where fulfillment comes from. It's from the amount of contribution mm -hmm. that you give to whoever that may be in your heart that mm -hmm. you feel called to. For sure. And I just want to make a quick remark here uh, before we move forward that the other reason, like now more tactical and more sales and more uh, to do with marketing, that this is extremely key for you to understand is that your industry, your market, your niche will most likely be driven by one specifically of this four. And I'll give you a quick example. I recently went skydiving. So that it's driven by variety, mm -hmm. <laughs> uncertainty, because yeah, you're, you're craving this experience, this emotion, right? Um, if you are driven by maybe your kids or living a legacy, you're probably driven by significance. You want to feel significant to those around you, to in those the eyes of your children. Exactly, in the eyes of the children. So just keep this in mind as you go through your avatar and, and you start establishing some of this. Um, you know, things in business for yourself. Exactly. And so with all that said, it's your moral obligation. We all possess a unique gift, skill, talent, expertise, or multiple even, that can transform the world for the better. It is therefore our moral obligation to serve others with that gift and step up to the leadership position we've been called to. And just a quote down below by Eleanor Roosevelt, when you cease to make a contribution, you begin to die. So again, similar, when you stop growing within yourself, when you stop developing yourself and learning and becoming a lifelong student, and then you then stop projecting that learning and those gifts into other people's lives, you feel spiritually as if you are dying. And that has definitely been true in our lives in many times. In the beginning of our entrepreneurial journey, we're you know, trying to figure out really who was that avatar, who could we really help and contribute to. Um, so it's a very real struggle and it's yeah. extremely important to feel like you are giving back right. in some way. Yeah, because uh, like I'll tell you, there was uh, you know, a business that we had in, in 2018 that, we, that was very e-commerce based. Like, you know, we made a lot of money in one month, uh, you know, back with Planet. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that even though like we were making money, we're still we're feeling unfulfilled. We're feeling like we're not making a contribution. We, we didn't really understand why it was feeling, you know, quote unquote empty if we were actually making more money than we'd ever made before. You know, like our Facebook ads were working, we were, um, you know, uh, just seeing sales roll in on our phone. Like we would get like PayPal and Stripe notifications like all day. And it was really cool, but there was something missing. And it was this piece. And that's why we want to make sure that you make the right choice from the beginning so that you don't go into something that seems good for the money, but it's also good for the contribution and for your fulfillment. Exactly. Because they, they can overlap. Of I think course, for a very long course. time, we, thought we like, weren't really we sure how it was going to work. But the, the bottom line is you can. You can absolutely make them both. Money is obviously, I'm so sure you know, not the end all be all. It's not going to give you fulfillment. But what a beautiful thing when you can make money and a massive amount so that you could contribute that into of many course. different things you believe in and simultaneously feel like you are giving something of true value and changing someone's life. Right. That is the perfect balance. And that's what we want for you. And so the last part of the movement of impact is what we're getting into within the gift now, which is the new opportunity. 
So the difference between having modest success and massive success within your cause or your business in this case, and in turn changing the world comes down to implementing your new opportunity. So as an example, again, the new opportunity was the civil rights movement itself, which promised that African Americans and all ethnic groups would obtain equal rights to those of white Americans. They would achieve the right to vote in political elections, protection against violence and discrimination, and desegregation of schools, restaurants, public transportation, etc. And the strategies in particular that were to be used were nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience, such as protests, marches, mm. and boycotts. Yes. And so what Martin Luther King and other leaders of the time were promising were that, you know, it, we're not just going to improve the laws. We're not going to give African Americans a couple more laws, a couple more rights than they already have. No, no, no. We're going to give them a completely new opportunity. We're going to completely eliminate the current system the desegregation that's been going on and we're going to completely wipe all of that out and now everything is going to be you know a hybrid of all different ethnicities in one room in one place we're going to eat together we're going to learn together we're going to live in the same communities together we're all going to go vote together for the next president the next mayor this is going to be possible for all of us and so i'm not offering you just an improvement i'm offering you a completely new life and that's what this is. Exactly. And the way we're going to do that's it. That's why you want to make it feel. <laughs> for exactly. Your it's a completely new life. It's not an improvement. It's just a completely new slate. And the way they were going to do that was with nonviolence, with peaceful protest, marches, boycotts, which again, it's different if you look at someone like Malcolm X, whose slogan was, you know, by any means necessary. And so even within the civil rights movements, there were different promises and different methods being made there. But in the case of Martin Luther King, this was the new opportunity. And so it was a promise of a new life, a new America, a new country. And again, so the reason it was not an improvement offer is because nobody wants improvement. They want new. The goal of your new opportunity is not to fix what's broken. It's to replace what's not working with something much better. And the main reason for this is because Many people have already tried to improve, whether it was with their own strength or with another opportunity that came around, an improvement offer, and they've tried. They've already tried multiple ways, and they failed. And so in their mind, at least, they believe that improvement is not possible. I can't improve. Right. And to give you an example, um, you probably have heard of P90X. And so and when they came in, everyone in their market was trying to get a pill, right, to lose weight. And everyone thought, and then everyone was preaching the same thing, which was, it's easy, you just drink this shake, you just, have, you know, get this one pill, and then you'll be good to go. And people were not obviously seeing results. So then they came out and they say, guys, it's actually super hard. And it's gonna be like crazy, but you will, like, you will see results. And so it was a completely new opportunity, and they jumped in it right away, and it became a multi-million dollar company. But guess what, they didn't, get it right the first time right when it came out. Mm -hmm. They had to make their commercial 15 times before they even got it right. And that's because they were not positioning it as a new opportunity. They were positioning it as a improvement offer mm -hmm. until they fixed that. So, right. so that it tells you the power them. of that. Right, so I was reminding them of the other failed attempts. Exactly, the failed if it reminds you of, of the last attempt that you thought you know, or, or that you maybe tried or you looked into that sucked, then you're not going to go for it. There's no way. Exactly. Yeah. And so the next one, 90% of people are extremely unambitious. So similarly to what you were saying about P90X, the main reason why the majority of the population still today is trying to find quite literally a magic pill to lose weight <laughs> or to make and, and get the dream or body or the dream health, whatever it may be, is because most of us are extremely unambitious. We don't want to do the work. And so most people are not really interested in self-improvement and improving. You have to sell it to them as a completely new opportunity. Only 2% of the population approximately is really going to be interested in improvement and actually want to do the work and be willing to do it. And so if you are trying to sell an improvement offer or bring an improvement offer into someone's life, you're pretty much eliminating 98% of the market. And we obviously don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the next one is it reminds them of poor past decisions. So exactly similar to what we were saying. If you remind them, if anything in what you are marketing to them or saying to them reminds them of a past mm -hmm. attempt, mm -hmm. 
and a failure, they have to recall that it's too painful. Wait, Most pain. people don't want to admit that they made a mistake. Right. It's painful to admit. And well, it's a good thing. When it comes to your marketing, people don't want to be reminded of those horrible times. And if it does bring up really ugly memories of past mistakes and failures, oh, yeah, so sure. they're going to go into a pit. They're going to go into a dark pit and not want to associate anything with what you're trying to give them, even if it is the, the amazing opportunity that's going to change your life. Yeah. Now, there is a time and a place for agitating fears and talking about problems and making them, you know, understand that their own uh, actions are going to lead them to a really bad cause if they don't fix it. But we'll get to that later. Exactly. And lastly, you become a commodity in a red bloody ocean. And essentially what that means is because a lot of people in business don't really understand the difference between improvement and new it's true i didn't get it for a long time mm -hmm. did you, you get it for a long time no definitely not <laughs> <laughs> did you get it uh cat right there <laughs> yeah like believe me most people don't no and for that reason a lot of them are marketing their product and service no matter how amazing they are as a simply an improvement offer and because of that you want to completely have a contrarian approach and differentiate yourself and what we mean by that is being in a blue ocean a place if you can imagine yeah. the part of an ocean that, where exactly we're going to get more into detail but if you can imagine an ocean where there's only one shark you're the only shark in that area and so the amount of fish and sea life that you have to feed off of is immense you're the, there's no competition you're the only one because you are in a place where you're the only shark in every single Every single thing in the ocean is only for Yeah, you become the big fish. Exactly. You're a big fish in a small pond, as opposed to a bloody ocean, which is where a lot of people in business, they start to compete with each other, and they just have add-ons and improvements. And so they're in the same ocean, the same part of the ocean, fighting with thousands, if not millions of other sharks for the same fish, right? So we want to get you out of that. We want to completely differentiate your opportunity, something that's new and fresh and exciting for your audience. For sure. For sure. The practical organization offers opportunities for self-advancement. A mass movement appeals not to those intent on bolstering and advancing a chair self, but to those who crave to be rid of an unwanted self. Mm. This is again by Eric Steve. Hoffer. That's good. And so this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, even the first and second lessons uh -huh. of ridding yourself of the old self and becoming the new self. And that's exactly what a new opportunity does. Mm -hmm. It's not for the people who are content with wherever they are currently, in their mediocrity, in their pain, the people that want to wallow in misery, the ones that have no intent on actually moving forward. It, mass movements are not for them. In the civil rights movement, these were not people that were you know, trying to convince themselves that the way they were being treated was eh, not so bad. No, it was people that were saying, this is horrible and I will not put up with this anymore. Right. I'm not going to be violent, but I'm also not going to pretend like this is okay. And yeah. so they were completely hell bent on creating a new reality and a yeah. new self that was deserving of dignity and respect and equality. Yeah. Hot or cold, but not, not lukewarm. Exactly. And so new opportunities, therefore, create massive global change. And the main reasons are because it's a new discovery. Again, people do not want to be reminded of the old mistakes they've made. They want to be someone who's innovative. They want to find something that's new. They want to be early adopters, even in some cases, be the first ones who discover this new opportunity and jump on board with that because it's new and it's fresh and it's exciting. It also leads them away from pain. So instead of leading them through the pain, again, and reminding them of all those mistakes, or reminding them of all those failed attempts, it says, no, you know what? This didn't work for you because there was something wrong with this opportunity. This was just improvement. There was something wrong with it. No wonder you failed. And so instead, I'm going to lead you away from that pain. I'm going to give you something even better that you can't even imagine. Yeah, completely different. Exactly. So it's a dream replacement. Again, it's not the same dream altered. It's a completely new dream. And it's greener pastures. So it's not, again, just sort of imagining seeing the same patch of grass. It's like we're going to take you to the complete opposite side of this hill and make it completely new. And some examples that we have below, whether it's from religion in Christianity, whether it was Jesus Christ in this example, what he came to offer was not an improvement offer. He didn't just come to say, I'm gonna better Moses' laws, tweak them a little bit, but keep the laws here. No, it was forget the laws, forget that, keep them in mind. But what I'm offering you now is the true path 
to, to God is a repentant heart, right? It's a, it's a kindred spirit. It's compassion. It's forgiveness. True repentance. That is what a true connection to God is, not following a set of rules. Yeah. So and known. as a matter of fact, he, he even said that the whole law would get fulfilled in you know, just those two commandments of loving God and loving one another because you know he that's why it's even divided into the old testament and the new testament because it became a new opportunity a new testament a new vote right and so you know when you're able to create a new opportunity it's pretty much guaranteed that it will take on because people are dying and you know, really longing for new opportunities. They don't want something that just makes them feel a little better, a little faster. No, they want a completely, you know, a complete paradigm shift. Exactly. New hope. And then lastly, here's Steve Jobs. The people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And so in his case, while everyone was, you know, trying to fit more songs onto a CD or onto an MP3 player, Steve Jobs came around and said, no, this is a really new device. This is the iPod. Right. And this is going to be able to, you're going to be able to put on your entire library of music. And just a couple more songs. Completely new device. Same thing happened with the iPhone. Completely right. just reinvented yeah, the phone. Like revolutionized. Yeah. Laptop. Now you have the iPad. Just a completely new invention, a new way of yeah. living with technology. Yeah. And this is what we want. We all want to be people that think differently yeah. and that do... Let's take the contrarian approach. I think it was Steve um, or uh, Ford, sorry, that said that if he would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, because at the time there was no vehicle, so they were just like, you know what? Yeah, like uh, give us uh, faster horses. You know, give us uh, you know just better horses. And he's like, no, you need a car. It's like a completely different new right. transformation uh, or uh, a vehicle of, of transportation, you know. I mean? Well, that shows sometimes we don't even know what we want because we can't right. even imagine that it's going to exist Correct. one day. That's why faith and vision is very important. Exactly. All right, guys, I want to talk to you about defining your niche and standing out, okay? This is, we're going to start getting into, you know, some meaty things here. And so I want you to be completely focused into this stuff. So we talked about differentiating yourself and, you know, this is just basically how it looks like on a general marketing versus a niche marketing, okay? Customer interest targets many people with no specific interest in a, in, in a product versus targets a small group of people, they are likely to buy a specific product or service. Conversion rates, low conversion rates, but higher number of leads. Niche, high conversion rate, but lower number of leads, right? So you, you see that quality versus quantity. And again, if you are starting out, if you are pretty much you know, below a million dollars, you, you want to think of niche because you're not ready for the mass market. Like you need to you know, go so much deeper and so much more... Um, High ticket, when I say high ticket, I mean like people that are willing to pay more money for it. Again, like going back to the iPhone, which is a wonderful example. Um, at the beginning, like people were, you know, paying so much money, like they've never ever paid before for a phone. It was the most expensive phone ever, you know, when it came out. And people thought these guys are crazy. No one's going to buy it. But the early adopters, the niche market that was ready for it boom, jumped on it, and then they made sure to carry out later to, you know, the early adopters and then the early majority and the lay majority. And you can look up this uh, concept called the law of diffusion of innovation uh, on Google when you get a chance. And so you'll see the differences between broad keywords, you know, just marketing or whatever versus saying like, hey, online coaching business. Right. And even that is getting saturated. You have to start drilling down like, you know, we're going to start focusing more ourselves into like couples specifically couples that want to have an online business that is through education and coaching, et cetera. Right. So how do we do this? How do we drill into into this uh, new opportunity, new niche, like what you will be creating? Because even if you have done things in the past, you most likely need help redefining that niche so it sounds fresh to your market and to whoever you'll be buying. So here are five secrets to reverse engineering yourself. Number one is focus. And so a lot of you might think, well, this is not a secret. You've been saying focus for a long time, but check this out. One single point of accumulated energy is always better. The one thing asks this, 
what is the one thing I can do today that such by doing so, everything else would seem easier or unnecessary, right? Most people try to overcomplicate it and we try to overcomplicate it for a long time and then you end up having a ton of little pieces floating around and you don't have, you know, a structure and a system that really works. You, you, you don't have a straight line anymore. You start having all these wiggle lines. So simplify and simplify in reverse engineering yourself because you want to find what's the one thing that you have to offer which gets us to our superpower. Everyone has a gift, all right? Everyone has an unfair advantage, a superpower, something that makes you, you. And here is the thing. Sometimes it's hard to know for yourself what it is because it's so close to you that you don't see it. Sometimes you think you know it, but you have to go deeper. And so I'm telling you these things right now so that when they happen, you might believe and you might remember this lesson. So... I want you to ask people around you, you know, ask your spouse, ask uh, friends around you and, and say like, you know, if there was one gift that you think I have, one superpower, like what, what do you think that is? Because sometimes it will literally connect all the dots for you. Number three, your skills. These are areas of expertise that you have actually acquired or will acquire through learning and studying. Okay. This is like this program. It's a, uh, you know, a educational program, a school, online, reading, creating, you know, this is, are not things that were almost like innate from you, such as the gift, but these are things that you start acquiring. Now, when you've done the focus, you've done the superpower, you've done the skills, and you go into your interest. These can be hobbies or what you're passionate about. And number five, specialized knowledge. What are you good at that you're above average than most? something that you're awesomely good at, okay? And this is, um, I'm gonna show you some really cool graphs in, in a second that might tie it better for you. But for now, memorize this. If you can find a why bigger than yourself and your purpose aligns with what you do and you can solve big and scary problems inside your marketplace while doing it, then you will win. Mm -hmm. Like, do not make this more complicated than what it is. Sometimes people dismiss it because it is so simple. And this is how it looks. It's a proven system, proven to work. It's called sustained growth. Your purpose and global impact, you know, that's why we, we get you started with a vision. Because if you don't know what kind of business you want to make, you just say, oh, I want to make a million dollars. Like, great, Billy Jean. But how are you going to make a million dollars? Well, there's a billion different ways to do it. Right. And, you, and are you going to enjoy the process? And are you going to enjoy the process? Because if you don't, you probably also won't even get there. So. You got it. You're going you're gonna, to you know, be defeated before you even really start getting traction. So your purpose and global impact is first. That's why it's at the top. That one drives your niche that has a problem, that big and scary problem. Notice it's problem because we want to drill down to like a one solid specific problem and more on this later. And of course, what you do to solve the problem. So again, if you can align those, it becomes a beautiful ecosystem. And so check this out. I want you to take a very close look at this. The yellow circle represents what people will pay you to do, right? The blue circle represents what you are awesomely good at. And the pink circle represents what you're passionate about. But do you notice where the sweet spot is? Right in the middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> and so you want to make sure that you get to that sweet spot because believe me, if you are too much to the right, too much to the left, too much up, too much down, it will be miserable for you because there will be pieces that we're missing. Again, like money is obviously the lifeblood of your business. You need cash, you need sales, yes. But if you don't have a predictable nurturing system because you don't really have a message and you always be advertising you'll be a noise in the in the marketplace instead of a new opportunity with that within oh, this yeah. chart it's kind of like as some examples you know when you're not really focusing on uh, a serious problem within the marketplace then you're not really searching about what are people actually gonna pay me yeah for? pay you to do what do they want it's kind of like you know you get the whole starving artist item it's like Right. I, I love painting. That's I, I, right. love, that's a great example. I love my music. I love what I'm doing. And that's wonderful. Maybe you're extremely talented, but you're barely making ends meet. And I mean, hey, maybe some people that's 
maybe that's really what they want. Maybe but I, what you want. I would say that the I majority. I what you know people want. There's different. I would suspect causes. the majority though are more like trying to convince themselves that there's not something they can do with an equal passion, bringing right. that skill into something exactly. where there is a problem. Yeah. And you know, spending the time to really find what is something that I can add value with and actually make right. money. Because yes, we tend to with the more creative artistic side, we kind of get stuck in that starving artist mode. And the point is we're no good to anyone if we're not actually getting out there and we don't have the resources to do massive change. Yeah. Because again, you want to make it a sustained growth. We don't want something that works for a little while and then dies. You know, don't don't be like uh, a shiny object entrepreneur, you know, cause you'll make something work and like a few hundred bucks. And again, like I've done it. I was, I was generating leads for different clients and I would make, you know, money here. And then I would go into this other business and yeah, like, of course you will pay the bills, but growth didn't really start happening until we got serious and we started systemizing and making sure that is the sweet spot. And so I want you to memorize this formula. Okay. If you can have a niche and a problem, and you create that new opportunity and you put it out there in a consistent, beautiful, well-designed offer, it will lead you to results. And when I say results, it's plural because it's result for your client and it's result for you too, which means cash, which fuels the business. And then the business grows and, we, and you can serve your customer better. And again, it becomes a sustained growth. Say it with me. Sustain, bro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I get passion. I need my, uh, my uh, psychic. Um, all right, awesome. So let's go into this part, which is the secret to all selling in a nutshell. All right, from current situation to desired outcome. This is one of the most important slides you'll ever see. And as simple as, you know, uh, almost like second nature, it feels like, yeah, of course, I'm taking someone from point A to point B. But like, really, what does that look like? And notice where those arrows are of the things that have value because people that you want to serve with your product or service or advice are at point A. And you are trying to get them to point B with your product. Okay? And so you might be asking, okay, so what's the gap? What's that gap? How do I exactly bridge that gap between point A to point B? Because sometimes that is how it looks like. It's not, mm -hmm. you know perfectly linear learning time. Sometimes you learn things that you, you know, kind of doesn't really click and then you learn them like a couple of weeks later and you're like, Oh my gosh, now I remember what I read in this other book like a week ago. That's usually what's linear. Yes. <laughs> it's usually not straight. Exactly. It's not linear. Yeah. And so remember we thought we, we, we talked about linear versus nonlinear and in a sense it's linear because yes, you're trying to get them to the closest way possible, but in the granular detail, it becomes, you know, very, uh, non-linear and so the gap the gap is you the gap is your product your system your methodology mm -hmm. um, and that is exactly what bridges the gap and <laughs> it's funny because I found this patient I'm like yeah this is often how it feels that you're like stretching to make this work and, and be able to to put this uh, bridge over it but the beautiful thing is that the more you do it the more you understand your avatar and understand your niche and you understand your market the easier it's going to become and memorizing this will make you lots of money because you will now be able to sell anything you want. It's simple yet powerful. People buy futures and outcomes, not products. They buy painkillers, not vitamins. Say painkillers, not what? <laughs> vitamins. vitamins. <laughs> so great. Oh man, when I get excited. <laughs> when I get excited, I start, you know, just talking my heart out. All right. So step two, the new way to select a niche and understand your market. So check this out. Here are the three markets and the niches slash, slash sub niches. Okay. And the first thing you'll read right there, it says the richest are in the niches right over it. So I want to take you through both of these ones, um, this graphs real, real quick. You got health, relationships, and wealth. And in reality, there's only these three markets. And if you can really see where yours fit or you're kind of confused, you know, take a look at the second one uh, as you see them breaking um, apart a little bit. So wealth, for example, is also online business. You know, it's any kind of uh, thing related to earning money, making money, having a certain lifestyle or living. 
relationships can look like marriage. There's dating, there's parenting. These are sub niches or sub market of the market. Okay. Very important to understand the difference between a market, a sub market, a niche, and a sub niche. All right. As you go down, you drill into deeper parts of the market, deeper segments of the market that have things in common, but are starting to become smaller, more defined, more specific. Right. And so we can see here, you know, the example of health and then the niche is weight loss. Right. Now, maybe back in the day, maybe decades ago, if you just had some kind of a workout regimen or some pill that was for weight right. loss, yeah, maybe that did really well because there was pretty much no other people within the market of health yeah. that were selling supplements for weight loss. Through the internet. But as yeah. but even in the beginning, even yeah, it was off right. the shelves, if there was only one or two different people that were doing that or companies that were doing that, there wasn't much competition. It was very easy to stand out as a new opportunity. Right. But then as it became very saturated and now everyone and their mom had a different supplement for losing weight, then it became very difficult. And now it was bloody. It became a bloody ocean. And so then you had to go more specific into the sub niche, into those little circles at the end of weight loss to kind of expand what the promise was that you were giving them. So as an example, I think, you know, Garcinia Gamboja. Cambodia, yeah. Was, you know, that became very, very specific for a while. Everyone wanted that. Yeah, because it was, it was the new opportunity. It's a supplement, <laughs> but it was, you know, one particular plant. Yeah, one particular was, plant that was like amazing. And everyone was like seeing these amazing results. And everyone was starting to jump in the bandwagon. Now, guess what? That one's saturated now. It became bloody. But in reality, the riches are in the niches because that's when you can get the most cash flow up front and you can build your business faster. All right. And here's the truth. The truth is that you must carve out your spot in the marketing ecosystem. Okay. These are the three core markets, like we said, into the sub markets and see that little boy right there with his hands up. That's you. <laughs> That's me. That is where we want to be. We want to be in, in a separate niche, in an ecosystem that you build on your own, that it's unique, that stems, yes, from the submarket, but it's not like other niches and it's not the submarket. All right. So we're going to go a little bit deeper. How does that actually look like? And, you know, how does it look like for you? All right. So once again, here are two amazing graphs that you know, go back to that sweet spot. So your ideal niche is a combination of your passion, skills, and experience. Your ideal profitable niche on the right-hand side is a combination between the high market demand, okay, we talked about that, what people will pay you for, low competition, because again, there's not a lot of people doing this because it's unique. And number three, a high income potential. They not only want it, but they are able to pay it. Do you understand the difference between right. high market They're and demand? Willing, willing and mm -hmm. able. High market demand and high income potential. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, the market wants it, but they can't afford it. You know, like I'm sure there's a lot of people that want a, you know, 52, 60 inch screen for their living room, but not a lot of people can afford it. So not everyone will be the market. Right. And that doesn't mean that no one within that, you know, income bracket will buy it. It just means that those people are not going to be the ideal avatar for not the that ideal. product. Exactly. exactly. The majority of the avatars of people that are buying that product are not yeah. there. They're somewhere else. They're in a higher income bracket. Yes. Yeah. And there's a time that will come for you to expand on products, expand on, you know, going from targeting only, you know, 30-year-old single moms that have, you know, two boys, you know, and then you'll go into all moms and then you'll go into maybe even guys, but you don't do that until you're at like millions of dollars. Right. No, it, it literally focus is going to be your best friend. One product, one funnel, one traffic source. One thing. One thing. <laughs> okay. And a red ocean strategy is equal to, what everyone and their dog is doing like check out all these zombies there literally this is zombie apocalypse. yeah zombie apocalypse everyone just it's like trying to make it trying to run trying to get somewhere they don't even know where they're going 
and it's a complete mess. And this is what the marketplace looks like nowadays. So people don't like ads and you know, sometimes they say, oh, like marketing doesn't work or like social media doesn't work. And it's like, no, you just don't know how to make a blue ocean. <laughs> ah, did you, did you get that same sense of peace? Like I just got it from like this horrible convoluted, like giving me anxiety to look at to this beautiful, peaceful, like the whole ocean is yours. Like, you know, <laughs> go ahead and, and have fun. And don't compete with rivals, says W. Chan. Make them irrelevant. Okay, and I would recommend you read the Blue Ocean Strategy. It's, you know, very insightful. I'm going to give you a quick, you know, uh, overview of that because it's important to you, for you to understand. Number one, compete in existing market space. A red ocean strategy, you'll be competing like with that zombie picture versus the blue ocean where you create. You see that difference between compete and create in uncontested market space. Number two, you're trying to beat the competition, okay? People in business, they wanna beat the competition. Guess what? Forget about beating the competition. Think differently. You wanna make the competition irrelevant. Okay. Is this strategy is what has revolutionized, um, you know, different businesses that simply took off like Under Armour or Instagram or Uber or Airbnb. They were new opportunities. It, it was Apple. never done before. P90X, Apple. P90X, Apple. Completely new. Completely new opportunity. Approach. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to exploit the existing demand, you create and capture new demand fresh instead of making the value cost straight off you break the value cost straight off and instead of aligning the whole system of a firm's activities or business activities with a strategic choice of differentiating differentiation or low cost instead you want to align the whole system of a firm's activities in pursuit of differentiation and low cost you don't have to choose because you're creating this from scratch now don't forget though that niches and audiences are in constant state of change and evolution don't just guess what they want ask them ask them like go into forums go into you know groups go into and we're gonna get more into this stuff but you can start doing this now to select and define and create your niche don't conform you want to be different again the grass is green where you water it okay it's not that you want to try to steal someone's or you know fight with someone that already has or try to beat and all these different things it's green when you cultivate it where you put your effort your energy and your attention into but here's the key question the key question is who do you want to serve and why it's powerful it's a powerful question and here's a quick note for you. Do not make it about you, okay? There, there's a time to reverse engineer yourself. We talked about that. Talked about your skills and your you know, knowledge and your experience. And you're trying, to, you're trying to find that sweet spot. But when you ask this question, you do not have that. You get rid of it. And you think, I want to be a vessel of glory. Just a instrument so that you can literally give that gift to the world, to who you're serving, without judgment, without transaction, without thinking, because I'm telling you, it will sabotage you. If you're running these ads, making these campaigns, and telling yourself, I gotta make this money, I gotta make this money, I gotta make this thousand, two thousand, three thousand, like whatever money amount you have in your head, as you're doing this, like, it will not work. It's gonna be, like, people will smell the you know, hypocrisy behind it. And again, like we, we were doing, you know, certain things before that we caught ourselves on. We said, wait a minute. Why? You know, it feels forced or it doesn't feel natural. Why? It's a means to an end. Yeah. Why we, is it that? We yeah. Had to break out of that because that was mm -hmm. a very unhappy place to be. Yes. It wasn't, it wasn't making us happy and it certainly wasn't making our clients happy. Right. So we had to find that middle ground, something that we're good at, something that we love, but focusing on really how can we make this the most amazing experience for the client. And believe me, when you have it right, you're going to be crippled by opportunity. What's going to happen is you're going to have people that are going to come to you and they're going to want to 
you know, get your help, but you're so niche, so specialized that you have to say no. And we get this now all the time. People that are like, hey, listen, I would love to work with you. And they want to throw me three, four or $5,000. And I'm literally just without even hesitation saying no. Can't. can't. I can't serve you because you're not who I'm serving specifically. Even though I would love to help you and I would love for everyone to be served and I would love for everyone to, you know, get help. I can only serve a specific group of people and specifically at the beginning, you know, before you even get to a million dollars. So what about getting to a million dollars first without one thing, one source, one offer, et cetera, then worry later about expansion. Don't, don't mix. Don't, don't think that more is, is better because it's not. And, and it is a trap in the marketplace. People think that better is, uh, sorry, that more is better. Here's a word of warning. Don't think my niche doesn't work. They all work when you apply the process. We've seen it over and over, construction, uh, e-commerce. We've seen it in yoga. We've seen it in travel. We've seen it in the gun niche. We've seen it in the survival niche. We've seen it in, uh, I'm trying to think of like all the clients, all the people, uh, in the essential oil market, in the Mm -hmm. CBD market. We've seen it in, I'm trying to give more multiple examples just to make sure uh, in the transformational coaching, consulting, any type of thing that, you know, requires, uh, you know, digging and, and, and solving problems. And, and, and you'll know, you'll know that people are people and the market is the market. You know, there's the law of averages, the 80-20 rule as well, the Pareto principle. Like these things are laws all over. You know, they, the trap is thinking my niche doesn't work and, and wanting to switch. So. Make a very conscious decision when you do. And don't just traditionally choose a niche. It's what everyone else is doing. Instead, create a blue ocean around your unique superpower and cultivate your audience. Again, the grass is green where you say with me, water it. (laughs) Word of warning, another word of warning. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be super scary, but you must face your fears head on. And I found this image is like drawing. I, I thought it was phenomenal because that is literally how it feels. It feels like it's raining and the wolf is staring right in your face, but you can overcome it. Most people struggle with clarity when it comes to their avatar or choosing who they want to serve. So break out of the linear chains and don't be afraid to create something that no one has ever done before. After all, before Google existed, we all needed to consult libraries to get our questions answered. So be different, but also have smart market data to verify they actually want your solution. As I say, don't guess, ask. Right. And so now we're going to get into the very last portion of the lesson, which is how to create Starting to get practical. your ideal avatar. Exactly. So first off, let's give a definition of ideal avatar. What exactly is it? And very simply put, it's basically the ideal person that your business aims to serve with your specific expertise, services, or products. And we say person, yes, there are going to be some variations within, you know, all of the customers and clients you get, but you want to create one very specific person with a name, an identity, (laughs) how they look, how they behave, what they believe, one person in mind whenever you are creating any kind of marketing tactics, your product is for that one person. And so I just want to talk here a little bit about the current self versus the desired self versus the undesired self. And kind of going back to what Andes was saying earlier about the gap. Yeah, the point A, the point B. Where Mm -hmm. someone currently is, where you currently are, and where you desire to be versus where you do not desire to be, this is what really makes anyone buy anything. This is really what makes the market. And so the current self is a state without any change, desire nor hatred. You're just, you are where you are. You don't have any desire or hatred towards any kind of different self. The desired self, a state of desire that causes the current self to feel a deficit namely feelings of inadequacy, Mm. low self-esteem, and unhappiness. And so you can quite literally see this with any product. We were kind of talking about this yesterday. With some things, okay, again, we'll just, just for the sake of argument, because it's such an easy niche to talk about, if you're talking about weight loss, let's say, 
it's easy to see that if you are, you know, signing up with P90X and you want to do this workout because you want to change your body, the way you feel, you very evidently don't feel adequate in your body's health. And for whatever reason, whether it's more physical or internal, there's something lacking there and you're unhappy with your current state. And so you want the desired self, which is healthier, happier, more fit, more energy, more just all around holistically better in health. I love this. Part. Now, love this part. it's not as easy to understand maybe in the example we gave yesterday of, well, what if someone wants to buy a really expensive painting? And you're like, what is that you know, desired self? What is the desired self that they're imagining if they want to buy an expensive painting? Well, you have to go back to those human needs, those six human needs that we talked about earlier and which one is really motivating them. And so we'll get into more of that a little bit later, but as an example, if it's a very expensive painting, it may be that they want to put that up on their wall because they want to seem perhaps, you know, very elegant. They want to give off an elegant kind right. of persona. They want to give off a more wealthy persona, maybe a more cultivated or educated persona. Right, so that would come down to their feelings of significance. They get that from, you know, how they decorate like their home and how people of, you know, see them when they walk in that environment similar to buying a car that's like a little bit better a little bit newer even though you know uh, you're the only one looking just because you want to feel fancy on the streets as you drive it or whatever it is right? exactly so we'll get more into this a bit later but yes definitely something to keep in mind the reason we buy anything is because we have a certain desired self that we are striving towards and then the exact opposite is true for the undesired self so the undesired self is a state of hatred that causes the current self to feel adequate, which in turn removes any need for change. So again, so now if you are saying, this is kind of what happens when we judge other people or we judge something that we don't like, and we say, oh my gosh, I would never do that. I would never ever behave like that, or I would never buy that. I would never have anything to do with that. Well, we're basically saying that we feel therefore adequate in who we are and ourselves at the moment. And in some cases, this is good, yeah. right? If you, you know, feel totally peace, confident whatever. in yourself, yes, and you're happy within yourself, and you're like, I don't really need to buy those clothes. I don't need to buy that food because I'm happy as I am. I don't have to change. Wonderful. But this can also be detrimental when we try and convince ourselves that we are okay in the certain state that we are, when it's very evident deep down there is a desire for something more, for something Greater. better. Mm -hmm. And we want to break out of me mediocrity, but we're too scared. too scared. And so we don't do anything. And so Back these, the exactly. So these three different states of self are very, very important to understand within your business in general and in your life. So the gap strikes again. So as we know, the reason that Yugi and anyone on this planet buys anything is because there is a gap between the current self and the desired self. We therefore take the action of buying because we, A, want help achieving the desired self. So we recognize, okay, I need help with acquiring this new self and I'm not really sure if I can do it on my own. And so I'm going to hire someone to help me to work side by side with me, or I'm going to buy this product and it's going to help me get there. That's the first reason that we buy then. B, we want to speed up the process. So instead of saying I need help, you're kind of like, okay, I think I can do this on my own, but I really have to get there by a certain date. I really have, you know, I'm squeezed on time. And so I really need a product or service that's going to help me get there even faster. And then C is they want to follow a proven process that gets us there. And so, right, as an example, it may be the authentic authority in your case. You're saying, you know, maybe I could try and figure it out on my own, but I really at this point feel that I want a proven process that's worked for someone else before, and I just want to follow those steps. I want to follow the yellow brick road right. and get there with a proven path. Right. And so again, the big question, the main question, your ideal avatar is, what is the gap that you can and truly wish to bridge? And who is the person that most wants the desired self on the other side of that bridge? Okay, so that's the question that you have to keep in mind. Similar to what Andres was talking about earlier, right? You're going to be the one who's bridging the gap with your product service expertise and then deciding, okay, what do I really want to bridge? What am I capable of bridging? And who is the ideal person that really, really desires what's on the end of that bridge? Exactly. Okay, so now we're going to dive into the mind, heart, and soul of your ideal avatar. Pay attention. 
Okay, so in order to obtain a deep understanding of just who your ideal avatar is, you must understand that all humans are motivated by external struggles as well as internal struggles. While our external struggles are often painful, we always, always take action due to our internal struggles as they are intrinsically linked to our six core human needs of certainty, variety, significance, love and connection, personal growth, and contribution. So again, you're gonna have external problems always. In the case of money, as an example, when you're struggling to find a job or a career path where you feel like you're not making enough money and you want to get, you know, from five to six figures, let's say it is. Okay, the external problem is you're saying, I want a little bit more money so that I have extra money after I pay my mortgage, after I pay the bills, right. after I pay the groceries. I don't want to be just getting by. I want to have extra. Right. I want to take a trip. I want to do some investing. Yeah, I want to do whatever I want. But... So that's the external things. Yes, you want a nicer home. You want nicer clothes. You want to go on a trip. You want a vacation. Wonderful. But it goes deeper than that. Those are only the external things that you can see, but those are always motivated by internal needs and struggles. And so the real need may be, I, there's too much uncertainty in my life. There's too much variety. I don't feel like my need of certainty is being filled because I never know if I'm gonna have enough money, I'm just gonna have enough. And I don't know if, you know, I'm fulfilling the love and connection between my spouse or between my children because I'm away from them for so long. And so I really like to be working from home or doing something else. And so it has to do with those internal needs. Always, always. That's the reason why we always end up taking action. And so three key insights of your ideal avatar. You are going to get worksheets on these. You're going to be diving into the psyche, into the heart, into the emotions and the life of your ideal avatar. But mainly the three key insights that you need to understand about your ideal avatar are number one, their problems. What are the problems that they have in their daily life? What are their struggles? Number two is what are their fears? What are they constantly worrying about in their daily lives? And three, what are their desires? The ones that they tell people and the ones that they don't tell people. And so their biggest problems, some key questions that you may wanna keep in mind, and again, you are gonna be doing this throughout this week more in depth. No, we got a bunch of some, awesome resources for you and some like really good questions, but it's a big Some overview. key questions, mm -hmm. yes, are what frustrates them on a daily basis? So if you could ask yourself, you know, what are the three main things that ugh, every day, those are the same frustrations they constantly face, what are they? What things do they no longer want to experience or deal with? So what are they completely just fed up with? Right. I'm tired of dealing with this, I don't right. wanna feel this way, I don't wanna think this way anymore. What are those problems? What's the biggest problem they have? So if you could, through your research, find what is the number one problem in their life? What is it? And have they tried to solve this problem before? If so, why didn't they succeed in solving it? So if they tried to solve it with a different product or services, it didn't work obviously because they're still here looking for your solution. Right. Why didn't it work? What happened? What went wrong? The greatest fears some key questions to ask. What fears or worries keep them up at night? So they're sitting in bed, their eyes are open, they can't fall asleep, their mind's racing. What are those fears or worries that are just bombarding their mind and their heart? So whether it's financial problems, emotional worries, psychological worries, what are they? Really get in depth. What are the consequences of waiting or continuing on like they are. So if they don't take action with your service mm -hmm. or product or expertise, what are they worried about is that's going to happen in their life? Are they going to be homeless? Are they going to lose their house? Are they going to feel inadequate? Are they going to divorce their spouse because they're having problems? Are right. they going to, is their health going to deteriorate? Their health going to get worse. So really try and get into both the internal and the external consequences. Uncover the web of pain you know, be, behind the symptoms, behind the problem, you know, there's always a deeper web of things. Right. And so, you know, it's your job to dig it. Exactly. And what is the underlying cause of the problem they are experiencing? So if you go back to the, the problems that you discussed here, what are the underlying causes of the problem? Because as we know, fear in some shape or form is usually at the root of most of our problems, <laughs> whether it's actions that we're taking wrongly or actions that we just refuse to take it's usually some kind of fear and so what is at the root of that and are they even aware 
of that fear or that issue that's at the root. And then their deepest desires. What do they secretly yet ardently desire the most? So kind of going back to what I said earlier, there are some desires that we're all going to admit outwardly to ourselves, to our spouses, to our friends, to our family. But there's also desires that are more internal that we may feel embarrassed or even shy about expressing. So as an example, if we go back to the core human needs of significance, whether we want to admit it or not, we are all motivated by significance to some degree. Some of us more than others, but it's there. And so, you know, if we desire to create an online business or if we, you know, desire to be able to travel as we work because we want to, you know, show people that we have a certain amount of freedom that they may not have, there is a certain level of significance that we're not going to want to admit. And the point is that it may be, you know, I really want to feel significant or important to my children, or Mm -hmm. I really want to feel significant in the eyes of my parents. So I really want to feel significant in the eyes of my friends who haven't seen me in a while. And I want to really inspire them, whatever it is, what are those secrets that they really desire and they don't really tell people to. Mm -hmm. And if they could wave a magic wand, what would their life look like in six months to a year? What are some specific external and internal things that would make them feel more happy and fulfilled? So again, on the external life and then going into more of the psychological and the emotional needs, what are those struggles and what are those things that would really make them feel super happy and fulfilled and loved? So again, at the end of this all, when you're going to go down to detail and you're really going to investigate online, meet people in your life that you feel are the avatar, you should be able to describe your ideal avatar's problems, fears, and desires better than they can themselves. When they read your advertising, when you make a post, when you talk to them, they should feel like they should almost feel like you're stalking them. They should feel like you are hiding in their closet and you are listening to their every problem <laughs> or you're inside of their head. They should feel as if, I don't even understand how this person understands what I'm going mm. through to this level that they do. And they're describing my problems and the solutions that I need better than I can, so even, good. Than mm-hmm. I can even articulate myself. Mm. That's how they should feel. And so at the end of this all, your one thing, if there's one sentence at the end of this entire lesson, at the end of this week through your worksheets that you should be able to articulate, it is a very simple sentence. I help ideal avatar, whoever that is, to desired self. And so whatever solution or whatever uh, main desire it is that they, they want, that's your one sentence. So as an example, I help coaches grow a six-figure business online. I help single parents become their children's heroes. I help accountants attract high-paying clients on Facebook. And again, we are going to get more into the specifics of how exactly you're going to do that when we move into the offer. But at the end of this week, basically what we just want you to do is who is the ideal avatar? Who are you helping and serving? And what is the desired outcome, the desired self that they're seeking that you are promising you're going to help them get? Cool. So I'm going to tell you how to create and use an empathy map. And you'll notice here two pictures of this, um, you know, almost like a refiner's fire. And it's very key because if you have done up to this point, the exercise well you will be able to do this exercise and you should be able to do this exercise so you should be able to create two things number one the empathy map and number two a day in the life of your ideal avatar okay so what is what does this look like okay, so an empathy map looks something like this and you will find a sheet in your uh, in a resource section think and feel see say and do and here now again how does this look like well here's a really cool example her name is jamie what does she say she say that i was expecting something different or what do you think where should i start what brand do you like what size is best i want something reliable right and and this is an example of a buying a tv yeah yeah this is just a basic example she's buying a tv she thinks that oh maybe i'm missing something or wasting too much time I want something awesome. Why is this so hard? Too many acronyms. And again, these are just small examples you want to fill, obviously, with your specific avatar. Uh, What does she do? Well, she 
<laughs> observes in the store. She asks friends about it. She compares other products. You know, like not everyone will do these things. This is not general. This is general to Jamie specifically. You know, some people will not check on a website. Some people will not ask friends. It depends on who your avatar is. So it's important to um, differentiate the example from obviously what you'll be doing. And how does she feel? She feels fear or she feels excited. She feels anxious depending on what it is. Unsure who to trust or overwhelm. It's a very clear example of, you know, a deep understanding of your avatar. And number two, a day in the life. You should be able to write down a detailed average day from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed. Again, don't guess, ask, research, make new connections, etc. We're going to give you all these uh, different sheets and resources, but take the time to open Google, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, you know, every possible source of information out there to start asking the right questions. Exactly. Specifically, depending on, of course, what your niche is, but Facebook groups are wonderful. Right. You can really get really an Join a few communities. Of you know, what people are asking within the niche, what they really want. And of course, because Facebook, you can also add them as a friend and then see, you know, their personal life yeah. as well. Literally copy and paste some of the questions and like, like ask them in the group. Like I'm telling you, like that's straightforward. Like if you're in the right group or like, let's say it's like a, a cat niche. It's a, a niche where everyone is like talking about, let's say make it more specific. Let's say make it a sub niche. Let's say it's Bengal cats, you know, group. Um, and again, you ask some of these questions and you know you have the right people when they start um, you know, coming out and you can even look at their profiles and see if they match the description that you, um, you, know, that you thought for your avatar. Exactly, and Reddit as well. Reddit's you good. Find different forums. There's lots of good questions that you'll be able to get a lot of helpful answers from that. Yeah, so. yeah. Ask, 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 ask is your best friend. Um, don't be afraid also of getting on the phone. You know, I, I, I often recommend with people when they really don't know or they want to really dive in, like, like have a few conversations. Just ask them, message them. Like, you'll be surprised if you message people and say, hey, you want to meet for like a, you know, quick chat, a quick vir virtual coffee type of thing. And, you know, I just want to ask you some questions. I'm doing some research in this niche or I'm, you know, about to launch a product or a new service or whatever it is. And it's really key to, um, you know, just go through the process and it's going to be scary. You're going to feel like we are like maybe asking these questions, joining these groups and your mind's going to tell you to quit, but keep going. Okay. And so we are now just at the action steps for week three. So number one is you're going to complete defining your niche worksheet. And so this is, again, we're gonna ask you some questions here about what are some of the niches you're interested in. And you will hopefully by the end of this be able to solidify just what that perfect niche is for you. Number two, complete your ideal avatar's mind, heart, and soul. So you're gonna go into the problems, fears, and desires of your ideal avatar. Number three, complete a look into your ideal avatar's life worksheet. Number four, complete empathy map worksheet. And of course, number five, as usual, upload your weekly debrief video in the Slack community by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so, of course, all of these four resources that you're going to be doing throughout this week will be posted in, your, in the login area, and it will be there within about 30 minutes, as per usual. And you'll be ready to go. And so last but not least... When you try to be everything to everyone, you accomplish being nothing to anyone. And so again, this is just a reminder that because we know that the ideal avatar can be such an area of struggle, because it certainly was for us, you feel that by going broader, by going wider, that you're gonna be doing better service to people, to humanity, and it's just not true. There will be a time where you get to serve more people, but in the beginning, it's better to be a very specific leader and hero to one type of person than to try and be everything to everyone because it's simply impossible. You just can't. And so you end up being uninspiring, very uninfluential, and pretty much nothing. So if you want to be influential, you have to be very specific. Yeah. And you, you go deep. And then once you catch some roots, then you start going, you know, out. And I, I, I love the analogy or the example of a bamboo you know, and how it grows 
under the earth for like four years before it actually sprouts. And so it tells you of the solid foundation of the solid, you know, like depth of, of root of any, you know, really huge movement or huge tree in this example that will do. So, you know, don't be afraid of creating your niche of being different, but go out there and do start making connections, start asking these questions. You'll be surprised what you find. You'll be surprised how you get inspired, but trust the process, go through each of the areas and try to reverse engineer yourself as we said as well. And, you know, it's, it's going to be really key. We really wish we had, you know, a training like this when we, when we started because so many people gave us fragments, fragments of the things that we've told you. They all like one only kind of talked to us about the empathy map and that was good, but it wasn't enough. And, you know, another, you know, kind of told us some more deeper questions of the avatar, but you know, they were missing some things. And so, you know, what you see here, this lesson has been in the makes for, you know, years really, uh, when it comes to the amount of value and information. So take it very seriously, take it to heart and do the work. Go out there, ask people, join groups, join channels, subscribe on people's newsletters that are in your niche, in your industry. Just take it all in and believe me, if you do this well uh, within a week, you'll be so solid in your avatar that you might even be able to start talking to people. And we've even had people that within that first week of just being, you know, very clear on who they're serving, they start talking to people and they even can sell them on the phone and they can, you know, collect money even before they make the product, you know, based on a very specific result and a very specific transformation that they want to give or specific product that now they have clarity on. Cause believe me, clarity, it's a maximizer. It's a wonderful thing. Right. How well, if you understand the gap, between the current self and the desired so self. So well, you That's understand the, the gap. That's mm -hmm. the key. Cool. So yeah, we want to uh, maybe not super long because you know this definitely was a longer lesson. But you know, always remember you can ask questions on Slack and you got access to us. Um, you know, we respond within you know twenty four hours or less. And so we want to make sure that you are, you know, using and utilizing all your resources to make sure you grow. And so we're going to go just into maybe like 10 minutes of, you know, maybe to see um, different questions or even just some frequently asked questions that we can um, kind of go into. So I'm just going to turn on, um, go into the, into the chat now. And I want to make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we see any questions or anything like that. Um, Here's a really good one, like a, a really good frequently asked question, which is, you know, how do I validate my niche? How do I know if my niche is good? Right. And so one of the answers for that, one of the you know, best answers is, you know, when you can see other people doing similar offers, similar in the niche, similar in the industry, and you can get a good idea. It's like, well, there's obviously people that are wanting this result, that are exactly. wanting this mm -hmm. gap. So that's one of the ways, you know, again, like there are sections in our sheets that force you and they'll tell you. That ask you specifically yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Are there people who are doing, who are promising a similar desired self result? And if so, what are they doing? How are they helping these mm -hmm. people get there? Or A, if, is it even helping them? Is their process helping? And if it is, what are they doing? Yeah, it's interesting because, yeah, uh, here we got, it says, yeah, you say to find a blue ocean empty of sharks, but to validate the niche by looking for sharks. That's right. So, you know, you want to go into the bloody oceans to take a look around to see what other people are doing, because only when you understand what other people are doing and when their weaknesses are, where their gaps are. Um, and, and again, like this is something that we found. I'll give you a great example. Um, you know, a lot of people were going really hard on just a lot of tactics and then they would overwhelm people and people were saying, we want, you know, to understand more of the why of the, of, of the situation. We want to, you know, understand a little bit more uh, of the mindset around it and they felt it was missing. And so, you know, one of the things that we're doing is we're positioning ourselves as being able to, you know, serve that gap of the mindset versus just tactics or just the, 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 the gimmicks that, you know, a lot of the other people would be doing. Um, so it says, uh, so the blue ocean might be referring to the same thing as the red ocean, but repackaged offer. Yeah, it's, it's a new opportunity. It might be, you know, a very similar product, but the marketing completely changes. Um, another great example actually is what, um, I don't know if you know Yellowtail, which is a wine uh, company. The Australian. Yeah, the Australian yeah. wine company. So what they did is they looked in the beer market 
and they looked at all these different you know products and, and, and the market of what they people wanted in the beer market and they said you know what we're not gonna try to be like this fancy nice wine you know super high price that everyone wants we're gonna make it affordable fresh gonna have some qualities of the beer and then they positioned themselves so cleverly they were like in literally like a matter of like six months i was reading this a while ago they went from like nothing to like millions of dollars because people were accepting it so well they had grabbed elements from the beer market they had grabbed elements from the wine market and they had created their own blue ocean it was it was fantastic well, i guess even within when you were talking about the p90x Right. That would be an example, right? Obviously, the niche would have been the health and the weight loss. The weight loss specifically. So they, yeah. okay, confirmed, which, I mean, is kind of obvious now, but perhaps when there wasn't many options, it wasn't so obvious that, yes, okay, millions and millions of people want to lose weight. They want to be, in the, they want to lose, they yeah. promise to lose weight. But the way the other promises that the other companies were making were, okay, yes, it's going to be very easy. You're going to be able to just pop a pill and everything's going to be wonderful. It's going to happen in two weeks. And instead of doing that, they took the contrarian approach and said, okay, we're marketing to the same people, definitely the people that want to lose weight, but we're going to go about it a completely different way. It's now, the way we're going to market is, is no, it's not going to be easy. It's actually going to be extremely hard, possible, but extremely hard. And the reason those other ones didn't work was because they were marketing it as super easy, super simplistic, what you really need is this workout regimen, this workout experience. This is what's going to get you that result. This is a new opportunity. So yeah, the same, same promise, but definitely a different strategy. Yeah, like a whole new different positioning, a whole different yeah, new position. um, thing. So yeah, let's see. Uh, any other questions right here? Let's see. All right, so people say, how, how can I find a low competition niche? Okay, so this is another good one of going into some of these Facebook groups as we recommended. Um, and not only Facebook groups is good because you can also go into Google and keywords. And what you can do is in Keyword Planner, it actually tells you if it's low competition or if it's mm -hmm. high competition, mm -hmm. you know, this is inside, uh, it is a free service that you can literally go into Google and say, Google keyword planner, and it'll give you a volume of searches. If you know what people are searching, would you say it's, you know, pretty likely that you'll be able to know how competitive or how, or, or not it is. It would. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Uh, uh, Daniel says, but you talk about pain that keeps lining up at night. If I'm looking to go into the entertainment slash cosplay industry, I'm not sure. People have a pain that keeps them up. It is a luxury good. Ah, even in that, there is pain. And even in that, there is internal struggles. Like, I'm telling you, when you start digging, you, you'll find that a lot of the times people want certain luxury things. They're covering yeah, for, for, for different uh, needs. And then you start understanding the, the, the lifestyle. Would you therefore say to go after less luxury and more essential niche? No, it actually, yeah. they both work. They both work. It really depends on taking all these different things into consideration. Like there's always going to be a market that, you know, buys as long as you understand your avatar, you understand what drives them, you know, like. Right. Man, For a woman that buys a designer yeah. bag, that's $3,000 from right. Louis Vuitton. Okay, yes, it's obviously not essential that she buys that, but for her, it feels like it is. Yeah. And even though I may think that's completely ridiculous yeah. to pay three thousand dollars for a handbag, to her that is yeah, giving her, her some kind like of internal significance yeah. in the eyes of other people. She in wants to be looked at people. as perhaps yes, very elegant. She wants to be looked at as beautiful, and that is giving right. a, an internal validation. Yeah. That she definitely feels that she needs for sure. Maybe you start digging deeper and you realize that man, like, you know, they're trying to make up with these external things because in reality they don't feel loved or they, or they had maybe a, a, a rough past of some sorts that caused now this need to they search can, for validation can. with their external, you know, uh, handbag, house, car, oh. fancy, you know, people that, that, that buy those, uh, um, really expensive watches. And you know, to each his own. I don't, I don't, I don't really judge. I don't really judge at all. But here is the key: um, these watches would actually make them feel 
significant. They will make them feel, um, you know, very loved by their uh, people around them. Hold on, I'm just getting some more questions here. Give me a second. Uh, do you find Louis Vuitton? Do you find Louis Vuitton market has higher barriers to entry than others? How can one gauge the level of barrier to entry, or does it not matter and, and the process work regardless of the market? Real talk. Yeah, of course, it creates a high barrier, but that's is, is part of their strength. That's the, that's the interesting thing. You know, they create a huge barrier. Like we create huge barriers too. I'm not, I'm not telling people, you know, it, it, even a lot of what the, the, the program contains until there's enough interest for me to even get an application. Because things that are higher ticket, that are in the thousands of dollars, of, you know, when it comes to product, you have to change the selling environment. And you're going to learn, you know, more of this later. But yeah, it's like you change the positioning. Louis Vuitton is saying, listen, this is what it costs if you want to represent this brand, this image. Of course, it's a super high barrier of entry, but that is actually a strength. It becomes more desirable Exclusive. for that market that is looking to validate themselves, cover that pain, you know, ease that pain with these external um, accessories, you know, that they sell. Does, does that answer your, um, your, your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting because each market segment, you know, and you can take a look at it with anything. Uh, let's take cars, for example. If I'm marketing, uh, you know, Honda, you know, economic model, et cetera, I'm highlighting things that for that avatar, let's say it's someone that wants to save money, that wants to have a reliable car, doesn't care about being fancy. And, you know, they find their fulfillment on, hey, is does it do the job It's driven by like certainty you know does it do the job versus someone that is driven by hey i want to buy like a porsche or i want to buy a rolls royce and it, it goes now into like luxury like classic but it's funny because when um they ask the guy uh hey are you in the business of, of watches you know going back to my watch example mm -hmm. he said no we're in the business of luxury we're in the business, you know, yeah, everyone's like, hey, like, how's the, how's the watch business? Like, you don't, like, I don't have a watch business. I have a luxury business. You know, I'm in the, in the business of selling people this ideal feeling of importance, right. of like VAP status, right? It's like similar to when, when people do a uh, college party, <laughs> You know, that it's like everyone entry, like five bucks. And it's like, you know, just kind of more like masses versus being like, listen, this is like a VIP party and it's like secret location. And, you know, it's, it's gala and everyone dresses in white. And all of a sudden you like, they haven't even told you the price. You're like, there's no way this is going to cost like five bucks at the entrance, you know, in, and, uh, and we just have beer from a keg. No, this is like, you know, fancy, expensive. Everyone's going to come well-dressed, probably going to be, in the hundreds of dollars to come into this club or event or, or whatever it is, maybe even thousands, right? So it's positioning, positioning as luxury versus positioning as, um, you know, being cheap. You also got to ask yourself, like, what are you, what do you want to be known for? Going back to the positioning, the superpower, you want to be known to be someone that is in a, you know, classic luxury, super, you know, exclusive, and it's driven by just only the few can get it. Or is it going to be like, hey, like, get it while it's hot, like hot dogs and burgers for everyone, like trailer, like super accessible, but it's a different price point, different strategy, different positioning. You know, you might go for more like thin lines, classic black, white, if it's, Just you know, classy what are, or... What are the drivers? <laughs> what are the drivers? You got to go back to your right. avatar. What are their main drivers? Yeah. Understanding really what they care about. Yeah. What, yeah. what they're seeking. We all we usually start people with the avatar because we find and, and this was for ourselves too when we start with the offer sometimes you box yourself in the offer and then you don't really you know it's hard for you to know how, what your positioning is or your price should be or all these different things but when you start with the avatar well you know if it's someone that already you know has all the basic needs covered you're going for this high bracket income very specific then yeah, you got to position it as like something luxury, something beautiful. It's more about the art. It's more about the, the workmanship of it, the, the, the taste of it, you know, similar to going to a very expensive wine tasting versus a, you know, a beer uh, market or something. Um, let's see here it says, as far as low ticket versus high ticket, should one focus on high ticket or is that uh, product or a byproduct of having a blue ocean? 
we always, always recommend starting with a high ticket. And here is why, all right? Most people, and this is a question that at first time you kind of like, you know, made me question a lot of things because they asked me, what is easier to sell one person at $10,000 or to sell, let's say, a uh, thousand at ten dollars okay does that make sense so mm -hmm. you're gonna sell a thousand people at ten dollars and then you're gonna or you're gonna sell one person at ten thousand so first of all yes of course you have to package and your product will be completely different completely different avatar yes but here's the thing it is not a thousand times harder it right. is not mm -hmm. so it's you can be a little bit harder. It's, it's, it's a little it's gonna be harder but it's not a thousand times harder right and so it's only once and it's only it's once to, like, and you get uh like this nice influx of cash right if, if people are trying to make you know money in a, in a fast way you know and and they want to put their all they want to you know give that max value max transformation max you know whatever that that they can offer make it extremely extremely amazing then great you're gonna probably be targeting that small group of people that can afford that louis vuitton bag you know, and, and that's okay because you don't need that many of them and you can create more cash up front. More cash up front gives you more leverage. More leverage means now you can hire people or you can, you know, hire coaches or you can hire or paid advertising to, to take it to the next level. But the problem is if you start the other way around, then it's going to be like 10, $10, $10, $10. By the time you get to maybe a hundred, you're going to be like, man, you know, I'm still at like 300 selling a $10. And it just feels like, ah, like, where are they? It's harder to scale a low ticket on uh, item than it yeah, is to scale right. a high ticket yes. and, and then go down, you know? So um, we're going to go later into value ladders and having multiple products and what that looks like. But as a rule of thumb, I always say, start with the highest, best, the most amazing offer that you can give. And then start stripping down to like create your second package, third package, fourth package, right? Um, let's see here. It says if dealing with product though, charging 10 K for an item means it has to be much better quality, etc. than a $10 item. Exactly. Yes. You would definitely spend, you know, so much more, um, you know, there's different ways to make it more valuable. You know, I've seen people make it more valuable by packaging information with a physical product. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden it has a higher perceived value because here's the key about like value and about pricing. It's not so much about what you consider valuable. It's about what they, or specifically your avatar, considers valuable. Perceived value is different than real value, right? And it's subjective. And it's, it's, and subjective. it's, and it's subjective. It may not be $10,000, the product, but it could be significantly higher than $10. Yeah. If it's giving them, and it always is, some kind of internal need is being fulfilled within that, right. such as the Louis Vuitton handbag. Yeah. Right. Do you want to be the Volkswagen or do you want to be the Rolls Royce? And there's nothing wrong with being the Volkswagen because maybe Volkswagen is what you want. And we always tell people like the best thing you can do is go hard on the direction that is right for you. Um, but it definitely creates more leverage up front. It creates more money. You only need a couple more sales. Let's say that you were selling a product that cost a thousand dollars, you know, and you wanted to make $5,000 like, Going out there and making connections with five people at a deeper level is so much easier than making, you know, hundreds of people at a smaller depth to try to sell, you know. And so it, it just makes so much sense to go niche first, premium first, high transformational first, and then go outwards. Exactly. So, yeah, let's see. We've got a couple more questions here before we, like, wrap up the session. Um yeah, uh, another frequently question uh, I'm seeing here says, how do I get traffic, you know, to my website, squeeze page, et cetera. And yeah, I mean, this is something we're going to go into later, but there's a lot of uh, ways to do it organically um, and paid, of course, as well. So we'll go into it after, but don't worry so much about this. Believe me, if you find the right places to um, get your a group of people that is there congregating that is your specific ideal avatar it's gonna be easy for you to get traffic especially with good content um here it says for example if you're selling x for ten dollars you could sell it for a hundred if you include a pdf on how to make x boom you got it you got it brother exactly there's ways to create more perceived value and it's around what they want and that's why before you even go into any offer 
getting a really good idea of where are they and where do they want to go or like what is valuable for them, what's important for them, because you can start to mix it up. You know, it doesn't all need to be just about the product. You can have a product that you have a, a paid, uh, you know, include a PDF on it and then maybe you have a mini, mini course video series that teaches them on how to make blank or how to, you know, uh, make it even better or, you know, there, there's ways to make offers complementary. And so, yeah, there's ways to, to package things, you know, in a, in a way better way. I mean, another great example too is, you know, Bed Bath and Body Works. Right? Wait. Bath and Body Works. Bath and Body Works. I always get that one wrong. <laughs> Bed Bath and Beyond and Bath Thank and you, Body baby. Works. <laughs> yes. They have such beautiful packaging that they can mm -hmm. charge the same exact candle, you know, that I see in Walmart for seven bucks. They charge like $40. Mm -hmm. And literally the only thing that changes is the perceived value. Why? Because they understand that they're not in the business of candles. They're in the business of making women feel cozy. And to feel loved, like I see my, I, I see my yes. wife, like, like, yeah, like nodding That's with true. her head because a very different feeling, very right? different so feeling, that's more, like the smell, very different feeling. It's the, the whole design. experience, right? It's the whole experience, and that's why it's key to know your avatar because they have this figure out to the T. They know that if you know it has a very soft material that wraps around nice in their hands, and they, there's a handwritten note. On, on the package and then there's this like bamboo thing like a lot of this stuff is like just not about the actual product it's about the experience mm -hmm. the feeling the perceived value of the client so of course someone will say yeah you know what I, I rather pay you know a hundred bucks for a nice packaging leather like nice hand note whatever because they're looking more for the experience more so than the utility of Right. For someone that's like, yo, I just want a candle to like light the way and to just, you know, because I don't have any, any lights in my apartment or whatever. It's a completely different volume. I just want the cheapest one that give me light peace, you know. Or some people may look at that. And I, I mean, most men, I would say, would probably look at even the candle industry as a whole as a complete waste of money because yeah. like, well, you just burn them and then throw it out. Right. So they're completely right. consumable. All it does is just give you a little bit of light that you don't even need. It's more for just the decor and the comfort of having it. But again, it just depends on what that product, what that service gives you internally. And that depends person by person. So it's very, very subjective. And that's why you just have to understand what drives. What drives, person. yeah. The deeper, listen to this really, really well. The deeper you can understand your customer, the more money you'll make. Because if you can solve problems for this avatar, it would really take you far in the way that you package products. And sometimes like, like be ready to, to keep changing and reiterating and you know, making it better and better as you get feedback from people. You know, sometimes you, you just don't know, you gotta try. You make the best offer possible, you get in the phone with a couple of people. We always recommend if it's you know, more than $2,000, you can you, like it's better to sell it, and even at the beginning, if you maybe don't, are, are are you know not as experienced making webinars or sales pages, you can sell them on the phone because people uh, build a deeper intimacy and relationship on the phone, and you can sell something higher ticket once you understand what makes them tick, what is something that it's gonna fulfill that gap, like bridge that gap between where they are right now and where they want to go, and you sell accordingly. So I hope that answers uh, the, the, the question. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the best examples I can give you of, of, of our own, you know, because it's, it's easier to talk about our own examples. Um, we started, I started selling websites, you know, and video services and photography services and design services and all these different things. And everything to everyone, everything to everyone. I'm like, whoever, like, yeah, if someone were to ask me back then, who's my client? I'm like everyone that wants a video, like whoever wants a video, right? Anyone with a website, anyone online. Right. <laughs> but the problem is when I, when you do that, then every, I just was, you know, looked at or considered as like the video guy. So if I need a guy, uh, I'm competing with all the other video guys. There's nothing unique about me. Therefore, my perceived value in the marketplace was only 500, a thousand bucks. Right. Exactly. Then later start specializing. I realized like, man, like I have to be more specialized, more niche. And like, then I discovered that if I make websites specifically for construction companies, you know, and, and, I, and that's when I was working with, with those guys and I understood yeah. the market, understood more what they wanted because I was working in it. All of a sudden my websites went from like, you know, that price to 
$3,500. Wow, it was the first time like I had sold a website like that was like that much. And of course, I wasn't even going to keep all of that because I had like one or two guys that were helping me, but it didn't matter to me. It was like, wow, like I just, it was a huge jump. And what changed was specializing. Now with funnels, specialize even more because it's all about like the sale and the specific marketplace with specific strategy. We can charge funnels up to like 25 grand for a funnel. You know, there's people out there that are that even way advanced than us. They're charging like a hundred thousand. Like Russell Brunson charges a hundred thousand for a funnel. A hundred thousand. Why? Because they know that a hundred thousand will probably make them a million. Exactly. It's a no-brainer. Yep. It's perceived value, they right? Know so that no one else knows their industry or how to help them better than he can. He's the guy. He's, he's the go-to. The guy to go to, right? So find your unique positioning in the marketplace because your blue ocean, your unique opportunity when it matches with the audiences, you know, and markets desires and problems, then that combination is going to be killer and you'll be able to raise your prices effortlessly because it not only is perceived, but it is actually more valuable because you understood the client at a deeper level than um, other people. Um, what, what other examples do you think you can give of like different positioning, something like that? I'm trying to think. Uh, just to just to en just to enrich, make sure that you know this concept is like cemented because it's really important. Uh, let me think of you know a basic example: ah, Starbucks versus uh, Tim Hortons here in in Canada. But let's just take uh, Starbucks as a whole. You know, why would anyone start a coffee company when there was so much coffee like already being sold? You know, in different places, it wasn't as popular. You know, not like it is now, but but it, it seemed like a commodity. They were crazy to charge three times more than, uh, you know, the, the convenience or the restaurant nearby. So in, in someone's mind, they would have thought, no, you're crazy. No one's going to pay. No one's going to buy it. Like, they already, exactly. They already sell the coffee in like restaurants and they, you can even buy it and make it on your own house. Like, why would someone buy it? But they realized that people didn't want the coffee in and of itself. Ah, interesting. <laughs> no, it's because it's a very interesting example. As I tell it, I get excited because it's a beautiful example of position. And they understood that they wanted that the client that they were going after and what the blue ocean they wanted to create was about the environment, was about how it was going to make them feel, not just to buy the coffee and drink it, but right. to hang out at a place. Like people don't want to go right. hang out at a bar. Right, it or was like an aqua restaurant. A European style cafe yes. for the first time. They took something that was working from, you know, Europe, that kind of vibe of like the nice, you know, kind of launch and like, you know, this this wine almost, right? So you can look across industries to take ideas to form this blue ocean, because most likely than not, you'll be getting people from some of the other sub markets or niches that wanna jump now on yours. So when Starbucks opened, everyone thought, man. Uh, all of a sudden, it, it tasted amazing. The coffee people were like, wow, this coffee is amazing. No, it's not amazing, bro. It's the same, but because it's created such a beautiful experience for you from the moment you walked in the door, the moment you park, like everything is like soft and nice and take care of and cozy and smell. And, and they even put your name right on the cup. Right. They, don't put, they don't put my name on, on Tim Hortons. They just say, yo, like your coffee is ready. You know, mm -hmm. who ordered a triple, triple, double, double, <laughs> right? But not in Starbucks. No, Americans don't say that. Oh, you're right. Americans don't say double, double sugar. Right. They just say like, yeah, double sugar or whatever. I did right? that in Orlando. I got some very weird stairs. <laughs> right. That's a burger. That's a burger. <laughs> and, and in and out, exactly. Yeah, yeah which we don't even have. Here. Yeah, we don't even have. I like it. It's delicious. By it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great example, right? Like, like think about, are, is your avatar going for the experience or are they going for the utility? You know, are they going for more than just, you know, what the product is or are they looking for other results that are complementary, you know? And so dig, dig in, right. asking questions and just being like a scientist slash Sherlock Holmes mode. Don't worry about offer. Don't worry about pricing. Because if you have those biases, like it'll mess you up. You got to go with a fresh mind to start doing this research um, everywhere. And, and then it'll come together. You'll, you'll all, of, all of a sudden be and say, man, like no one's solving this problem. Like, Everyone's commenting about it, asking questions like only like one or two guys are sort of somewhat doing it. And you're like, man, like imagine how cool it would be if I could just do this. And most often than not, you're, you're selling to yourself in a way, you know, because you are the avatar in a way. 
and, and, and if you think that, man, this is amazing and like it really, really excites you, like you're probably on the right track. Like keep exploring and match yeah. that with your- Yeah, a lot of the times you are gonna be motivated by very similar things, which is why you obviously always try to inject or infuse your passion and your skills within who that avatar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely is. Now here's another frequently asked question, which is, you know, once someone finds a niche, you know, can let it, you know, like kind of like inboxing also telling us like, is this niche good or is this good? You know? And it's like, it's so hard to tell if it's good because it's all about like the holistic view of the market. So the best way to know if a niche is good or not, it's to go out there and find actual data of whether you you know, interview five, 10 different people over chat. Like, believe me, like when you are uh, a very genuine and authentic, you know, in your approach, like people don't mind, you know, answering questions. I mean, like, hey, what's going on? Hey, so listen, you know, I'm working right now on a really cool product. You know, it's kind of like secret right now. I'm not really telling anyone, but you know, it's to serve someone like you. Would love right. to know, you know, a couple of questions and you start asking them, you know, hey, listen, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you wish you could, you know, see better in this product or in this kind of a thing that you want or, you know, you, you start digging and, and, and after digging, 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 if you have enough proof, you should be able to insert a product to fill that gap and it should be very smoothly. It's more just like the examples we have uh, shown you. So, um, yeah, I mean, of course, message us. Uh, we'll give you feedback as, more, as much as possible, but we want to make sure that you validate not with me or not with you, but with the market itself. All right, let's see. One more question. Uh, the intention is that we can deliver the gap filling niche product. So obviously I need to be able to create said product. I do not have a business right now, but there is the intention to make the very thing I sell. Any advice on the production side of things? Yeah. So this is another one where a lot of people get caught up in, yeah, like the product and they almost feel like they can't sell it before they, um, you know, have it or they, they have it produced. And this is also a false belief. Take it from us. We failed really hard on one of our first business. Like we, like got all this inventory, all this product, and we didn't really even know who was gonna buy it. And like, don't don't make that mistake. Validate your <laughs> offer first. first, sell it first, and be transparent. Like people don't mind waiting for something to be done or made when you tell them that you're gonna give them maybe an extra discount. You know, saying things like, "Hey, listen, like you know, this product is gonna cost like around five hundred bucks, but let me ask you, if I were to give you a hundred buck discount, like would you mind waiting, you know, a week around, you know, like we're just putting on the final details, or hey, I need to you know make sure that i can serve you at the highest level and so i want to you know make it with you if you're selling like a course or a, um you know some sort of training like it's always better when you can get their their feedback and input because then there's no um <laughs> there wouldn't be any holes like you ask them what they want and you give it to them any advice on the production side of things? Or do you find people are true to their word or are they just yes men? Well, this is why there's nothing better than a yes with a credit card. <laughs> a yes with a dollar because people that want things, they will put their mouth where their money is, you know? And so um, that's why I always recommend, yeah, a deposit. Uh, yeah, like sometimes it's just like that commitment, right? Of like, listen, like, uh, you know, after you've pitched your offer, you, you find it's the right fit, they want it, you know, whether it's this art or this product or service, and then you literally sell it, get that, and then you start working. And then if you sell it and the whole experience goes well, and then you ask more questions like, hey, how did it go? How, what, how can I have made it better? And so don't be afraid to even combine your advice into it to make it into something even more valuable where maybe if you're an expert at something you can say hey i'll also include like an hour you know uh session an hour call an hour video call or whatever to like you know see how i can help you in blank right you don't need to have everything perfectly figured out in the beginning no. and know the you know the perfect end product it yeah. really comes down more to the your intention too as long as you are being integral you're being honest that you are going to do your best to keep refining this product or keep refining right. the service then it is absolutely okay and it's ethical to sell it as yeah. long as you are doing your best and you will deliver yeah you will deliver you that's the thing yeah i mean it, another great example i can give you is um people that go on kickstarter okay kickstarter is a right. great example okay. because they are selling the vision you know, there, there's literally saying like, hey, listen, if you back me up with like all this money, like I'm going to give it's you, cost. it's the cost, right? Like, yeah, Kickstarter is literally built on the cost. 
and 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 the leader too, and the, and the current and desire self. And if they nailed it, all of a sudden, all these people are like donating from like all over the world. The person doesn't even know, but now it's their duty to fulfill it. And they of course got it at a, at a better price, or they got an extra incentive, etc. You know, exactly. Get the customer to invest instead of investors. Exactly, because the customer is the one that you are gonna be serving regardless. And a lot of the times, it's easier to to be in a nice like feedback loop where you sell it and you're asking questions and you're refining, and so that just will make your product so much more stronger. And then when you finally like launch it to the masses or you like start putting some paid traffic behind it, it'll be so dialed in because of your organic efforts and your, you know, one-on-one -on -one customer efforts that you'll be able to systemize more and more. But we always recommend start with the personal approach, more premium transformational so that you put everything you wish it had, you know, instead of the other way around where you're like, man, like, this is my best stuff. I don't even want to put it because it's only 10 bucks and then you feel bad. And like, we've been in that position too, where it's just not fun to be. So, um, yeah, I, I, I really think get that money up front because then, then there's no, uh, going wrong with it. You have a money, you're fulfilling now a, um, you know, product or, or, or need instead of, you know, creating it and spending all this time on production only to find out that it bombs. And, and believe me, like, companies big companies have yeah, done yeah, this in the past <laughs> that they like they have this massive like 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 boom like new product launch but like they didn't even really build like you know rapport with with their customers beforehand and so they didn't sell a single piece like oh tesla beautiful other example they sold the crap out of their you know first model at like an amazing discount and then they were saying that they were going to give them the car next year one year they made the customer wait. The customer literally built or paid over a promise. They didn't even pay a product. So that's why we tell you, don't focus on the product so much as you're focusing on the cost because people don't buy products. They buy outcomes features. and futures mm -hmm. and results. So I hope that answers your question and everyone else's question. And yeah, uh, I'll, Maybe uh, see if there any miss anything. Cool. All righty, we're good to go. Yeah, it seems like you know everything is good. And we hope you found that really valuable. Yeah, helpful. yeah. We we hope that was an, a really awesome lesson. Um, we're gonna put all those resources there uh, for for you to grab. Put in the work. It's gonna be really good if you nail this. Believe me, it's gonna be so much easier to um, sell people on it. <laughs> okay, well, yeah no worries no worries just you know send it in put in the work believe me like the more you do this it's worth it. <laughs> yeah the, the easier it's gonna become and believe me like we literally have had people that take this information get the clarity and they don't even wait to create the page and to like they just start chatting with people they get on the phone they understand really well what the people want and they sell it and they literally, like, you can just collect someone's information, put it on paper. Like, it doesn't require much to just, like, get that first initial sale, that first initial commitment. And it feels good because you get your first dollar online. Or, you know, if you're already ahead, you go to that next level, you get that nice big ticket. Now it's so much easier to work on the product and to put in your all because you know it's something they want and not just you working on something that you don't even know if it's going to sell. Like don't exactly. make the same mistake we yeah, made. You want the proof of concept. Proof of concept. Yeah. Always, always validate before you put in like so much work and just realize that it's going to bomb in the end. So yeah, do mm -hmm. it up already. Disconnecting here. This was an amazing, uh, amazing lesson of, uh, the week three of the authentic authority. And we hope that you, um, you know, loved it. Let us know in the comments and we'll talk soon. Take care.